Good morning, everyone, and thank you for logging in to see my talk today. Before I begin, I want to thank Henby for organizing this third culture symposium and for giving us this opportunity to discuss our work with you all. We're really excited to be presenting here again and look forward to any questions that you might have coming up after the after the talks from this session. Now, as the title of my talk suggests, today I will be discussing the ancient Maya groundstone industry of the Mountain Pine Ridge Forest Reserve in the Cuyahoga District of Central Western Belize that my Rio Frio Regional Archaeological Project has recently begun investigating. Now, when I say groundstone industry, I'm referring largely to the making of manos and matates, the foundational kitchen implements of my, past my houses. But as we'll see, other products of yet unknown function were being produced, uh, made at these workshops. The focus of my talk will be the Buffalo Hill Quarry site, a complex multi-component site, perhaps better described as a quarry scape, a term that was recommended to me by my colleague, Rachel Horowitz, who will also be presenting in this session. We first documented the Buffalo Hill quarries in 2022, and we began a comprehensive study of them this past summer. For this talk, I'll review the findings of those seasons with you, uh, and then I'll conclude with questions that will be guiding our future research in the region, including may, who may have been using the quarries, what role did the site of Nohochbatso play in controlling production and distribution of the goods that were being produced there, and also, when do the quarries date to? Now, to begin our discussion, we must first ground ourselves geographically. This is important to know where in Belize we're talking about, but also to understand why the ancient Maya groundstone industry developed there and not elsewhere. I also want to be careful to distinguish between the Mountain Pine Ridge Forest Reserve and the Mountain Pine Ridge proper. The Mountain Pine Ridge Forest Reserve is a protected area managed today by the Belize Forest Department. I'll often refer to it in this talk simply as the reserve. Now, the reserve gets its name from the Mountain Pine Ridge, which is a geologic feature, a massive granitic rock upwelling at the northern edge of the Maya Mountains in southern Belize. Now, it's important to, to distinguish between the two, the reserve and the geologic formation, because the reserve is not a homogeneous landscape. Most of it, as you can see here, is made up of the Mountain Pine Ridge formation, but the western boundary here holds a series of residual limestone formations that have been cut off from the Vaca Plateau, their parent bedrock, by the McCall River, represented on this map by the light blue line. And to the east, southeast, and north, you see there's the Santa Rosa group, which is another type of geologic formation associated with the mountain, with the Maya Mountains. But we're not going to talk about that today. Now, it's in that western area of the reserve, in the limestone formation, where the classic Maya people built Nohochbatso along the banks of the Rio Frio that runs through a section of that, of that uh, region of the reserve. Mountain Pine Ridge is one of only three granitic rock sources in the Maya lowlands. The other two, the Hummingbird Ridge and the Coxcomb Basin, are also in the Maya Mountains in Belize. Now, studies by colleagues who have presented or are presenting here and others, um, studies by them have revealed that when past Maya people chose manos and matates made from granitic rock, they almost nearly universally held a very strong preference for those that were made from mountain pine ridge stone. The groundstone industry thus developed there because it was one of the few sources of granitic rock in the Maya region, and it was the most desirable of the three. All right, with that background, I want to now turn to the work that we had done documenting these quarries. Now, we first recorded this site in 2020, and this is the map that we made during that field season. We mapped approximately 16 hectares of this site, and we identified two different types of extraction, uh, extraction techniques. We found sites that we called cut faces, and we also found quarry pits, documented quarry pits. And you can see here, these dark lines, the, the dotted line is the area that we surveyed. The dark lines represent areas where we find granitic debitage, which I'll show you that in a minute, but that's the production waste used, uh, left behind by the making of the manos matates. The pink shapes within each of those black, uh, hard black lines are the quarry pits themselves material being dug out of the ground. And if you can see the hash marks here, 
Those are the granite piles that we were able to identify, the granite debitage that we were able to identify. And just so you have a sense, this is what those what that it looked like. Even though we're not working in the in the broadleaf forest here, we are working in a really thickly vegetated area. It just happens to be low lying vegetation, really thick grass and really thick brush. This is actually one of the more clear areas that we were able to that we were able to work in. But you see in the blue shirts there, it's Moshi and Mike who are off in the bushes collecting data um, and finding the, the the extent of that that particular area of the site. Even with that dense vegetation, we were still able to identify a variety of tools that were being made that were discarded. So we've identified in 2022 about 10 matates, or matate preforms, or discarded during production. We found that quartzite hammer stones are, are everywhere at this site. We've also identified what we called, would have been called in the literature, mono preforms. Uh, we've identified 63 of these. And but we've, we've identified two styles. One are full loaves, uh, as you can see on the right here. This is a full loaf next to it with a hammer stone next to it. Um, but most of what we find here are half loaves. Now, many of these actually have pointed edges on them, which suggests that they were not, uh, they were not discards, but actually there were probably tools that were used in the reduction process during the making of the manos and matates, and probably the matates in particular. And we know that thanks to work done by uh, ethnoarchaeologist Brian Hayden in Highland Guatemala in the early 1980s, uh, he, he met somebody up there who still knew how to make stone tools or monozomatates using stone tools rather than the, the metal tools that were used today. And so him, Hayden, and, and Ramon worked together uh, to record the process of monomatate production with using stone tool technology. And so you'll notice here that he has a pick-shaped object in his hands uh, made out of basalt, the same material that he's chopping the, the matate with. And so it's likely that those those pointed mono preforms are actually not mono preforms, but, but picks. Surprisingly, we also identified a number of what we called bedrock milling features. These were small uh, polished depressions pecked into the bedrock uh, adjacent to and near some of these quarry pits. Uh, they varied in size, but most were about the size of a cereal bowl or so. Now again, just to remind you, this is kind of what the site looked like as we as we worked in in 2022. So some of the questions that we had then for the 2023 season were: How large was the site, the Buffalo Hills Quarry site? What was the source of the quartzite to make hammerstones? How much material was being extracted, or how was the material being extracted? Sorry. Um, and are there differences between extraction methods between the cut faces and the quarry pits? And that was our primary, our, our major research question is, is learning about the extraction. Uh, what was the function of the bedrock mortars? And to get a, a, a better sense of, of these, uh, considering the vegetation, thick vegetation on, on top of them, what does a fully exposed quarry or work, quarry workshop area actually look like? Now, we answered several of these questions actually before we began our 2023 season, or at least the first question before we began our 2023 season. Uh, we received LIDAR data, which is uh, uh, data that was collected from a laser shot from an airplane that's able to remove, digitally remove vegetation from the ground surface so we can actually see the ground. So these are our LIDAR data. And what you see here, the black lines are what we mapped in 2022. And the green triangles are suspected sites that we identified in the LIDAR data based on what we learned in the 2022 season. So we went back in 2023, we went to these, these uh, green triangles and found that all but two of them were actually quarry sites. But what was more exciting is that a lot more site didn't appear on the LIDAR. They were just simply too small to be noticeable be uh, between the background noise uh, uh, in the vegetation. So. In recon doing reconnaissance of these quarry areas, we actually came to find in the northwest portion of the site here, uh, this shape right here is actually a quartzite vein that uh, the entire hillside right there is covered in quartzite debitage. And so here the picture on the left is the chipped quartzite uh, from, that, from that vein, and this is a mound of quartzite reduction waste. So we actually have a quarry, uh, quartz, quartzite quarry and hammerstone workshop within the Buffalo Hills quarry site. So now the size of the site as currently mapped, it covers an area of approximately 45 hectares, though it's actually likely a little bit larger than that. 
Now, that's about the size of 63 football fields, international football fields or soccer fields. Uh, for my friends in the U.S., that's about the size of 84 U.S. football fields in size. So this is a huge, huge area. Another way to describe the site or to measure the site is that it spans roughly an area one kilometer east-west by about half a kilometer wide. So again, this is a, a really large, large site. That's actually roughly the size of my, my campus, Cal State San Marcos. What I want to do now is take a look at some of the features we mapped uh, during the 2023 season to get an idea, uh, to answer some of those questions, the research questions that we had. How is the material being extracted, bedrock mortars, etc.? To do that, we'll look up here in the northeast part of the site at a feature that we called feature 22. Um, and this is actually, this uh, this shows up in the LiDAR to a degree, but it's much larger than it appears uh, in the LiDAR. What you see here is that it's composed of a series of cut faces. That's what those lines are here. Um, and there's a whole, a whole wealth of them, uh, over about a dozen or so, if not more. Um, in these areas that we could see through the vegetation. Each of the dots represents an artifact, a mono, matate, hammerstone, etc. that I showed you before. Um, the colors represent the different, the different uh, type of tool that was, that was found there. As you can see, the debitage pile surrounding this cut face actually extends much further out than the actual faces that we were able to identify. Now this is what they look like here. Uh, this is a 3D model, two different versions, uh, two different views of the same model. Here you're looking at on the left from the from the side profile of the of this area, and then here you're looking at it from above. And just here, here's some red lines to show you what those cut faces look like. Uh, they're really they're really sharp cuts in the stone. And they're away again, so you can see them. This is what those features looked like from the ground looking up the hill, and you can see the different faces popping up through the vegetation from what we could see. One of the more interesting aspects of this site, of these cut faces, was that many of them had multiple uh, ground stone mortars with, uh, associated with them. And these were actually, what the pattern that we came to see was that these were on slightly elevated areas, suggesting that these were places where people were sitting. And so here I am, um, oh, here's those mortars. And here I am sitting on, in front of one, uh, demonstrating of what this looked like. These were probably bit, uh, mono finishing stations. Hayden shows this picture of uh, his colleague Ramon making a mono here. And as you can see, as he turns the mono, as he's pecking it, it's creating this divot in the ground. And I think that's probably what's happening here. We did find one that was partially exposed and partially buried in, in front of some sediment. And so aiming to try and learn more about these, uh, about what these were used for, we excavated here. It turns out that we didn't learn the function of them. Um, instead, there's the mono. Instead, what we found was that it was right at the edge of a, of a hillside going down, and at the bottom of it, we actually found a cut, cut face uh, on the on the hillside. Now, during excavations, this is actually what we saw, and the circle here just represents this, this, um, uh, the same the same rock sticking out of the wall. But we came across these large chunks of granite uh, left left more or less in place, and even the debitage. You can see here on the left side of this photo was these big, big, big granite slabs. So we didn't realize at the time, but we we're actually looking at what we found was evidence of, of extraction and how these are being uh, being made. To understand that, we'll go over to the southeast corner of the Buffalo Hill Quarry site uh, to a feature that we call feature 25 down over here. And this is what it looks like in the LiDAR. And just so you know, that the, to give you a sense of scale, this measures about 30 meters east-west by about 25 meters north-south. And it's about 0.14 hectares in size. So the, the, what we had mapped in 2022 is 15 hectares. This was about 0.14. What you're seeing here is that quarry pit. Um, so what does it look like denuded? This is one of our research questions. And this is what it looks like, fully exposed with the vegetation chopped off of it. You can make out two depressions here, one here, one here. Those are the two quarry pits. And you see the amount of debitage that was there. Now, what became immediately clear to us was how just how much material, artifactual material, was left just on the surface. So we piece plotted, mapped every single artifact that we came across as we walked across the surface. And this is the map that we have. Each dot represents a tool that we were able to identify on the surface. A few of these are from excavation units, but you see the density of these here. Okay. Now, if we compare that 
what our findings, uh, what, what we found here, mapped here, 103 hammerstones, 145 mono preforms, uh, including some picks, 59 picks as well. We started to identify picks later. So we're looking at over 200, uh, 200 mono preforms slash picks. Uh, that includes full loaves and half loaves, 13 matates, and two wedges. And I'll show you what wedges are in a minute. But this is in 0.15 hectares. Look at that compared to the 15 hectares. If we denuded this whole area, we'd be looking at thousands and thousands of artifacts. This is industrial scale production here. So we wanted to know again more about extraction though as well. And so we conducted a series of excavation units. Here we placed a trench from the, the rubble pit and unit and quarry pit one up to the up the slope of the, the edge of the quarry pit to understand how the material is extracted. And this here, Everybody's standing around that, that debitage pile in the center of quarry pit two. Excavations here too showed this slabs of granite being pulled out. Uh, various sizes of granite. Um, but this actually keys us into some of the ways that this was actually being extracted because there's a lot of waste being produced here. And it's not, it's not flake stone waste. It's actually this, these large slabs of granite rather than these small flake pieces. So here's a, a 3D model uh, of, of above, up of, above the base of the quarry pit. And it's in the southeast corner here, this bottom corner, that we actually came to understand the extraction methods. Um, we see here the range of tools that were commonly found here, both products and production tools. We got a mortar, a full loaf of um, mono, a hammerstone, and this is a pick. If we look, this a brick-like um, bar of granite has a beveled edge on it. And this is how they were extracting this. Turns out that they're using the natural bedding of, of the granite to extract the material. They were, they're were creating these wedges, these expedient wedges, not formal tools, but using the wedges in the debitage that they made to literally pry out the granite that would produce these big slabs. And they were just hoping to get out the best material that they could get out. So again, if we think about industri uh, the, about how much material is recovered in feature 25 compared to their 2022 survey, if we extrapolate these numbers to this larger area here, we're looking at, again, industrial scale production. This is production at a scale that's much larger than a single community or a few, a few individuals can do. We're looking at communities. And so to answer who might have been doing this, who were the stone workers, um, we have to look at some of the larger sites in the region. So perhaps Nohochbatso, was uh, were the people affiliated with Noah Bozzo were were making these? Uh, perhaps the people with Pak Batoon were making these. Perhaps people at both communities were making them. Um, we also want to ask questions too about uh, controlling uh, pr controlling production and distribution of the goods coming from here. Um, in 2023, also in our lidar data, we did identify a new plaza that we hadn't known about before up in the north of the site that you see here. And we did get out there to visit it. And it turns out that there's a lot of granite tools up there. There's also a lot of granite blocks being used in the architecture of that particular plaza. So we think that this actually may have been a, a granite marketplace, perhaps. Uh, lastly, answering the question of when the cores were being used. This is still a question that we're that's going to take some time to, to work with because um, there's not a lot of datable material here. We did find quite a few ceramics, surprisingly, but most of them are just non-diagnostic and the acidic soils of this area have really eaten them away. So we don't really even have uh, many good forms to stylistically date them. Uh, we did get a couple pieces that do suggest a late classic period date somewhere between 700 to 900. Um, but what was most exciting is that a lot of these uh, ceramic pieces actually had big chunks of charcoal associated with them and, and, and melted onto them, possibly some kind of copal or some kind of pine, maybe indicating uh, ritual uh, is a, a question that we're going to be addressing. But with the charcoal, we can provide, get some radiocarbon dates and we're hoping to get those here in the next in the next little while. So um, a lot of work going on here, a lot of really exciting research. Uh, thanks for letting me share it with you. And thanks to all these folks here. And I will look forward to taking any questions that you have. Thank you.